Welcome to SaulCast. Today we are talking about Season 5, Episode 3 of Better Call Saul, titled The Guy for This. We just watched the episode, so these are going to be our raw, immediate reactions to the episode, but make sure to check back later in the week where we'll have our full analysis and recap of the episode. Unfortunately, Adam can't make it tonight, but no worries. We've got my other brother here, Alun, to cover. Say hello, Alun. Yo. With that, I'm Gil, and let's jump into the episode. And by the way, if you're listening to this as a podcast, check out the link in the show notes where we post these instant takes to YouTube as a video, and you can see my beautiful face, which just enhances the experience. And now, without further ado, let's get into our reaction to tonight's episode. Alun, first thing I want to bring up, when that car showed up, and the camera zoomed in on the license plate, and there was that little bit of a buildup. Who's going to get out of the car? How long did it take you to realize that's Hank? When I saw the bald head. <laughs> did you know that he was coming back this season? No. Did you? I did, yeah. It was one of those things where I wish I didn't know it in advance, but they they kind of released some articles, and it was public knowledge that he was coming back. So one thing this show does is I think the longer they obscure a person's face, the more likely that it's going to end up being a cameo from Breaking Bad. So as soon as I saw, okay, it's a government vehicle, it's the DEA is going to show up, I was like, that's Hank and Steve. And it was so good to see them back. I thought it felt like Hank in his prime. You had a bunch of Hank-isms. And it felt great to see his reaction to Saul Goodman's name. You got to see him jovial. You got to see him get a little bit serious. And it seems like we're going to see more of him considering Crazy A is now going to be his personal informant. Yeah, it, and it, really, it really fits Hank's personality to catch on to the Saul Goodman joke immediately. Yeah. <laughs> And it felt like, uh, you know, one thing this show does is they do not shoehorn Breaking Bad characters in. This was super organic. It made complete sense for Hank to show up here. And my initial assumption is that that's the only reason they brought in Hank. They, they actually talk about how in the writer's room they have a big list of Breaking Bad characters. And any time they're going to have somebody show up, like let's say a janitor shows up, they look at the big whiteboard and say, did we ever have a janitor character? Would it make sense for them to show up here? So I figured that, okay, they need a DEA agent. They look at their big list to say, hey, you know what? Hank makes sense here. And it would be fun for the fans to see him, so why not bring him back? But I wonder if, you know, you look at Mike, you look at Gus, the other Breaking Bad characters they brought back on Better Call Saul, and they didn't just bring them back because it was fun. They brought them back to show us a whole other side of them, build up more of their backstory, and make us look at that character in a different way. And I wonder if they're going to do that with Hank and perhaps Steve, or if it's just going to be, hey, how great is it to see Hank again? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much more there is to Hank that we don't know, but I don't know. Maybe, Maybe we'll, we'll find get another spinoff. Uh, I'm hoping at least we get a moment where he looks at a rock or a mineral and just looks very intrigued <laughs> by it. So this plant the seeds early for that for that uh, obsession that came in later. Huh. What what is that? Mineral? Huh. <laughs> Worry. My wife's been shoplifting again. You know, I keep telling her to stop doing that. One of the uh, one of the best storylines in uh, Breaking Bad. Yeah. <laughs> no. And we have a meeting that we've all been waiting for. Saul and Lalo finally bump into each other. And I have to say it was an entertaining scene, but I don't think we've seen the best of Saul versus Lalo yet. And I think it was a little bit of a rude awakening for Saul because so far we've seen him totally in control when he's dealing with his cell phone criminals. He's Saul Goodman. He's, he's in his element. But here you can see he's super uncomfortable and he tries to get himself unintertwined with Lalo, but he's stuck there and he's going to have to work with Lalo. I think it's kind of funny how Saul doesn't seem to realize what he's worth. Like, he should be a millionaire. Yeah. Like, he can do it. He thinks, like, the, his problem is he thinks 8,000 is a lot, especially right. for these characters. Like these guys, he should he should be able to charge them like a hundred k for this. Oh yeah, actually, it's funny because when he said uh, seven thousand, 
I think, what do you say, nine hundred twenty-five dollars? Like yeah. I like missed the seven thousand part, and I thought he just said nine hundred twenty-five dollars. Oh, and I was like, <laughs> what the hell? And by the way, <laughs> listeners, if you ever need advice, if you're going into a negotiation or anything, Alun's the guy to talk to because he's the guy who never, who always makes sure he's not going to be uh, undervalued, and you're not going to be undervalued. Yes, I'm all about fairness. <laughs> That's right. Even if it's one-sided. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that Saul and Lalo, that was a little bit of a rude awakening for him where he's finally realizing, oh, crap, being a criminal lawyer means working with criminals and not just nonviolent felonies. Alon, did you expect that we were going to see that ice cream cone again? <laughs> no, I was wondering what happened. What was going to happen to that ice cream cone? Yeah, even more symbolism here. Not only did it hit the ground, now you've got ants too. Yeah, and they keep accumul- accumulating. Right, right. So, what is? Uh, walk me through the interpretation. Wait, what's your updated ice cream update on uh, the ice cream imagery? Right. So, first of all, you see, you get Saul and Kim. They seem like they're getting along great. This episode, right? It it seems like neither of them are really having any issues with each other right now. They're enjoying beer. They're enjoying throwing beer. They're enjoying cigarettes or one Mm -hmm. cigarette. Um, But looming in the background is this dilemma that's bubbling up. Festering wound. Yes. Like, they can't just cover up their, you know, future issues with beer and throwing beer and cigarettes, mm-hmm. the ants are coming to roost. <laughs> and, and and Saul actually comes face to face with that ice cream cone, which I was not expecting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I also think the, the opening um, sequence of the episode where you see one ant and then many ants, I mean, those ants were really enjoying that ice cream. So I figured that's a metaphor for all the joy that is coming uh, Kim and Saul's way. Yeah, and the other metaphor here... That was a joke, by the way. I didn't really mean that. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the other metaphor involved is that he, Saul's the one that dropped the ice cream, causing this whole mess of ants. Mm-hmm. He's the one who's going to do something to ruin his relationship. Maybe, but... Uh, well, actually, you know what? Put a pin in that. Let's come back to that, because I, uh, I have another thought on it. I also want to say, I bet Adam would have got that joke that I made. Forgot what you said. <laughs> exactly. My point exactly. <laughs> uh, back on the ice cream though, with the uh, with the the ants showing up in the opening sequence, I-, I loved how it slowly. At first, it starts off kind of silly. Like there's an ant showing up. You have that music, but it slowly becomes more and more horrifying. It it has this ominous music, and I think by the end, the score might have cut away. And replacing the score was this disgusting sound of ants chomping down on that ice cream. And to me, it almost felt like a sacrifice. Like Saul Goodman is giving that ice cream. That's him taking all the joy in his life and offering it up as a sacrifice in exchange for what's coming next. I guess the riches that he's going to get as Saul Goodman. And... When he next sees the ice cream covered in those ants, it's right after he had his meeting with Lalo, where Lalo basically, where he tries to get out of it and say, hey, next time you need a lawyer, my schedule is a little bit tight. And Lalo (laughs) says, you'll make room for me. It's the very next scene where Saul sees that ice cream being consumed. And I think that's basically the devil saying, the ants are the devil, and they ate his joy. And, you know, enjoy the spoils of your... uh, of your your lawyer career now. Yeah, but I bet you a part of Saul enjoys this. Oh, for sure, for sure. I think uh I think that's a running theme, I mean, in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. All these people all these people like Walter White, Saul, even Kim that are going further and further down that path of immorality, they're enjoying it. They're getting a thrill out of it. I think the whole time um, Saul's going to be enjoying this even as his life crumbles around him as he potentially loses Kim, for example. And then let's talk about Kim. So Kim and Mr. Acker. So when she comes back to his house 
and tries to quote unquote help him, shows him all the houses that are for sale. And then she tells him that childhood story. Now, my immediate read on that is that that story was a lie. Did you read that the same way that I did? Uh, no. That's, that's interesting because, so the way I saw it is that the very uh, last episode, episode two, she said, I don't want to lie to my clients. I read this scene as her saying, you know what? The right way didn't work. The way of the law didn't work. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do it the way Saul Goodman would do it. I'm going to tell a story. And I even noted while she was telling the story that the writers of the show must have studied influence or have some understanding of, of what you, how you have to speak if you want to influence people. And she uses very good imagery. She talks about their toes turning blue from how cold they are. So to me, it felt like she was being a salesman like Saul Goodman. And then Mr. Acker doesn't buy it. You know, he says, you'll say anything to get what you want. Well, you, you could use the truth and still be manipulative. So her being truthful doesn't mean that it's her being honorable. Yeah, no, that's at fair, totally fair, and and I think you're right. Even if what she's saying is true, she's still taking a childhood difficulty that she had and is is is, is using it basically to her advantage. She's not exactly being honest, even if what she's saying is true. And then, uh, shortly after that, she ends up back home. And another piece of imagery is Jimmy coming home and seeing Kim on the balcony. And I read that as Jimmy's down here in the mud and Kim is up above. You know, she's the holy one. But then later in the episode, after Kim goes to Mr. Acker, then she comes back and now she's below looking up at Jimmy on the balcony. So to me, that felt like Kim has basically joined Jimmy down there in the mud because she just used her dirty tactic on Mr. Acker. And then another piece of imagery... The first time they're on the balcony, they have uh, Jimmy puts a, a beer bottle right on that little ledge, and it's you know the slightest touch, it's going to fall off. And I saw that as another either metaphor for their relationship or a metaphor for being between the good and the bad, and are you going to tip over the edge and basically go head first into Saul Goodman or go head first into you know using these dirty tactics. And then when Kim comes back, the show has so much symbolism, it should be in a museum. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it'll end up in some of these uh, museums that celebrate you know, important works of television or film. Um, and that beer bottle, though, right, it's teetering on the edge. And then uh, Jimmy actually plays with it. He starts kind of tossing it. <laughs> and then Kim's like, screw it. And they just start throwing those beer bottles. So I was already thinking that those beer bottles are representative of are we going to go over the edge or not? And they literally start tossing them over the edge. And yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I just the first time they were drinking beer, I was picturing them just knocking them over for fun. So yeah, I, I was happy to see them actually do it at the end there. That looked like fun. Have you ever thrown a, a glass bottle just to watch it shatter? Um, No. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. We should do that. Next we're time next we're weekend. in a suburban area and we can do it, you know, and then clean it up after without causing any any problems for anyone. Let's throw a glass bottle. <laughs> next time we're at our parents' house, we're gonna throw a bottle and our, our mom's gonna be like, What the hell are you doing? <laughs> no, no, don't worry, it's from Better Call Saul. It's for <laughs> it's for the podcast. <laughs> um, Mike. Let's talk about Mike. So first off, did you when he told the bartender to take off, take that picture off the wall? Did you see what he was talking about? The Sydney, yeah, the Sydney Opera House, and you remember yeah. the, the significance of that? No, the son. That w- no, no, it was uh, Werner when they, he was at the bar with Werner, oh. and Werner was telling Mike about how his father was the mastermind behind the Sydney Opera House. <laughs> So oh, it's just man. reminding Mike of Werner. He can't get he away. Really from misses him. that guy, huh? Yeah. Well, I think it's not as much that he misses him. I mean, he misses <laughs> him, but it's also the fact that he executed him that I think yeah, might be he eating really misses away at hanging him. out with him. <laughs> 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 <That's good. laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so Mike's upset, obviously, leaves the bar. And how satisfying was it to watch him break that guy's arm? Yeah. I mean, a bunch of jerks. Yeah, seriously. Like, what like, the hell? <laughs> <laughs> just, just for no reason, just picking on this guy. You, you think Mike purposely walked down a street that he thought some bad characters would be on? So, I don't know if he did it on purpose, but he enjoyed breaking that guy's arm, right? Yeah, it's kind of like how uh, Saul and Kim enjoy breaking those bottles. Right, right. And well, what do you think that, what was the point of the scene? You know, of Mike breaking that guy's arm. Uh, to show that his way of dealing with his own personal issues is by taking it out on other people. And he's also really good at it. So it's kind of a good combo. Yeah, and that's exactly how I read it. Because I, I sat there and I was like, this is a fun scene. And watching him get to be violent and watching him get attacked and just enact immediate justice was awesome. And then I thought to myself, why are they showing us this? And I think it's no mistake that this scene took place right after the previous one where he's basically wallowing in misery. And what we see, like you said, how does he deal with it? He deals with it by by being violent, by hurting somebody. And I think this gives us a little bit of background on why Mike chose the life that he chose. Because if you watch Better Call Saul and you see Mike dealing with all this crap, you would think, why doesn't he get out of this? Because we know he sticks with it in Breaking Bad. And I think this tells us why. It's because violence is how he escapes from the misery of what's in his life right now. Yeah, it's it's also n- nice for them to show us a scene like this because, you know, sometimes he seems like a broken old man. So it's nice to get a reminder that he's still got this uh, skill in him. Right, right. They don't want us to forget that he is a badass. Yeah. And they want to make sure we don't hate him after he yelled at his granddaughter. They no, 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 don't don't worry. There's still still reasons to like Mike. Yeah, he breaks bad guys' arms. So. Yeah, not just little girls' hearts. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's a good slogan. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Up. It's a good slogan, but I don't know for who. <laughs> I guess if you're an assassin. There you go. I break bad guys' arms, not just little girls' hearts. Like, what? <laughs> if it was just one of those, then it would be, you know, if you only broke little girl's heart, that would be bad. At least he offsets right. it with the bad guy arm breakings. <laughs> you might want to leave that first part off your business card. No, I like having it on there. It's an honest day's work. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, and it also just occurred to me when you said Mike's good at it. That's another theme of the show is people that are good at something but don't know how to use it in a legitimate way. So Saul Goodman is so good at what he does, but he can only seem to use it for nefarious deeds. And you know what you're good at? Mike impressions. I think that... Vince Gilligan, that's his name, right? Should keep yes. you in mind if they ever do a young Mike, you know, series. Yeah, you think that Mike at like thirty sounds the same way he does at sixty? <laughs> yeah, I could see. It. I think he came out of the womb talking like that. If he did talk right out of the womb, you know. Hey, mom, I could go for some ice cream right now, and not like that one over there covered in ants. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's in the future. How does he know about that? Yeah, I can tell the future. I didn't mention that. All right. (laughs) By the way, an update on the... Adam loves to bring this up every episode. So I've got to put on my Adam hat for a second and bring it up. So as a reminder, in Breaking Bad, when Saul Goodman is kidnapped by Walt and Jesse, uh, Saul, his face is covered in in a bag so he can't see and he yells... He thinks that Lalo's been sent after him. He goes, were you sent by Lalo? It wasn't me. It was Ignacio. So I think this episode maybe gives us a little bit more to work with and think about what might have put him in that position. My guess is that at some point, Nacho, i.e. Ignacio, is going to make a move against Lalo. And maybe he's going to somehow get Saul's help. Maybe even without Saul's knowledge. And, and and so Saul will think that Lalo's going to blame him. 
So Saul's going to be Saul's going to think that Lalo is blaming both him and Nacho. And so Saul's basically saying it wasn't me, it was Ignacio. I had nothing to do with it. What exactly they did, I don't know, but I think that's the way we're heading. Let's keep watching and find out. Nah, I don't think so. Okay. This will be the last episode of Saulcast. <laughs> Saulcast. Well, Thanks it just listening. seems like it feels like things are heading in a dark direction, you know, you know, and it's I don't know if I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, I know. Who am I kidding? All right, Alun, any final thoughts on on this episode before uh, before we do our full recap later in the week? Yeah. Um, let me uh, – quick, a quick list of things I liked. Okay. Uh, I like that Lalo likes Saul. Yes. <laughs> I like that he's like, you're the one with the big mouth, huh? You know, right. you're able to talk your way out of things. I love I, that he heard the story of him and Tuco, and they went into like a pretty good amount of detail about it in this episode. Yeah. And I thought that the writers really trust us to remember stuff because they're talking about something that happened back in episode two. It's also funny that last episode, Adam was trying to remember, he's like, what was it? The, uh, her, his abuelita? <laughs> yeah. Bring it up this episode. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. I mean, I mean, it was a very memorable scene. Like, it's so well done, you can't forget it. Right, right. You know? And then when uh, Lalo says, and he let the two of them walk out of there, and Saul's so like, well, they rolled out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Lalo kind of respects his, uh, I mean, obviously he respects his abilities with speech, which is why they're getting him to help out with this situation. Right, that's um, what makes him the guy for this, the name of the exactly. episode. Exactly. Uh, and then I also like the way Nacho was like, when you're in, you're in. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think, again, it's part of that rude awakening for uh, for Saul. You love lines like that. Like yeah. in Creed, in the middle of the fight, when he goes, it's real for you now, boy. It's real for you now. <laughs> it's the I same do. thing. <laughs> yeah. Anytime they repeat something twice in a row, that's my thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, you know, and then, uh, you know, sometimes I get worried I may get a little bored with the Mesa Verde stuff because it's all convoluted. Like, I don't know all the contracts <laughs> and stuff, but I mean, <laughs> but I, I think, uh, <laughs> but I thought it was good character development for Kim there. And you know what? She's not wrong about contracts, you know? No, no. That's why they're contracts. That's right. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> <You're> gonna, <laughs> she's not wrong about contracts. That's why they're contracts. Yeah, the I mean, the old, the old dude's up. being kind. I mean, like, come on. If he if he was worried about this happening one day, he should have tried to, you know, figure something out with the contract earlier on. You know, he knew this day could potentially come eventually. Right, right. Though, I mean, looking at both sides of it, technically he's 100% in the wrong but they probably took advantage of him because he sees this contract. He sees I get five grand if they want to buy me out, which back then would have been worth a lot more than five grand. And a good lawyer or somebody that knows contracts would have uh, put in a clause around uh, inflation or something. But yeah, I'd like to see a spinoff of him living there with all these whatever they're building all around him. And that's just his life now. If, if I'm going to be totally honest, I probably wouldn't watch that spin. <laughs> what if it was like just a two hour long comedy movie? Uh, it's sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, I think we can wrap it up. So as a reminder, this was our instant take. But of course, check back later in the week. We'll have our full recap and analysis. Don't worry. Alun will be back, and Adam will be joining us as well. Um, and if you enjoyed this episode, please go into the Apple Podcasts app, leave a rating or a review. Uh, it, it really makes us feel good. Every one of those ratings that we see, it puts a smile on my face. It puts a smile on Adam's face. And trust me, it is hard to put a smile on that face. 
And once again, if you're listening to this as a podcast, check out the link in the description. You can go to YouTube and watch this as a video. And here and there, we're going to try and do live streams as well so you can be a part of the conversation. And vice versa, if you're watching this as a video, click the link in the description and you can listen to our full recap and analysis that'll get posted later in the week on the podcast. Thanks for listening.